everyone. So grateful to be here tonight. So grateful to have prepared a lesson for you. And I'm so glad that you all have one of these in your hand because I'll be referencing it tonight as much as I possibly can. Uh, when the opportunity came to me, and uh, it was still early, uh, I was very happy to be able to request the night that we talk about peace because uh, to me, I just love the practicality of it. I love the tangibleness of it, and I'll, I'll share what I mean by that with you. Um, when we think about peace, there's a lot of times when we uh, will use the word as, uh, you know, the English speakers, and we may mean one thing or another with the word, and a lot of times we can mean that I want some peace and quiet in here. Can you please give me a break? Uh, can I please collect my thoughts? And there's all kinds of definitions and uh, what you mean when you say the word peace. But it's very important, I believe, uh, for us to understand that there is a peace that the world offers and there's a peace that the Lord offers. That is a fruit of the Spirit. And of course, I want to remind you of John 14 and verse 27, where the Lord is about to go to the cross, and he says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give it to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. That is a tall order, I believe. That is when you look at it, and you, if you put yourself into their shoes, knowing what we know, looking back, what they're about to go through, it's a tall order for them to maintain peace in the face of what's about to happen to their rabbi, to their Lord. And so when we look at the standard that the Lord has set, and he tells us, as what I can read here, there's a counterfeit that the world wants to offer you. That's not what the Lord's talking about. He wants you to have the kind of peace he's talking about. And so to demonstrate that even stronger, I believe, let us go to Mark chapter 4. In Mark chapter 4, they're with the Lord. They've seen him do some amazing things. By Mark's account, they haven't seen something quite as amazing as what they're about to see. But Mark 4, 35, on that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But pay attention to verse 40. He said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Now stop right there and, and really take in what's going on and, and ask yourself how you would fare in that moment. Ask yourself if you're in this boat and water's coming into the boat and you're human, how much peace would you have? How pleasing to the Lord in this. Of course, we're not going to answer this out loud. Ask yourself that if you were to go out into a boat, even knowing what you know now. You're going out into a boat. Your Lord's asleep, not really paying attention to the wind and the waves. And you see the water coming in, even knowing what you know now. How much peace would you have? Do you have the peace the Lord expects you to have. Notice he's disappointed with them as you read this. Wow. That, again, what we call a tall order. He wants them to have peace regardless 
of what's going on outside. Regardless of what could happen physically. That's the kind of peace that he wants us to have. It's the kind of peace that will make a difference if anybody's blessed enough to be around you on a regular basis. He wants us to be impressive to the world. The world has something that they call peace. All due respect, I hope they do the best they can. They're in terrible shape without the Lord. They're going to do the best they can. This is just putrid. <laughs> they might as well be with the Lord because the peace he offers is better. It's not a counterfeit. It's the real deal. So much peace that you'll behave like the Lord. When there's wind and waves, you're not worried at all. You're not anxious at all. Now, I made this and laminated it because as a human being, I realize I might need to reference this again. Here I am teaching this class. I'm telling you, we as human beings need to remember what the Bible says about bearing the fruit, in this case, of peace. So it's something that if you were really amazing at bearing the fruit of peace in 2022, and you just let it go. You're not going to bear the fruit in 2023 that you did in 2022 based on what we're looking at here in the Word of God. Peace, real peace, must be protected. That's what we're looking at. The kind of peace that the Lord has in mind, the kind of peace that is impressive to the lost. That's what I wanted to talk about tonight. When we think about that fruit of the Spirit, that is peace. I love that these this series is about the fruit of the Spirit because it's such, that's what you would expect out of the Bible, it's inspired by God. It's such a good example, good metaphor. It's fruit. If you want some peaches on the tree. You're not going to stand in front of that tree and say, peach, peach, peach. <laughs> right? That doesn't work. That doesn't work. You can't do it. You cannot cause a peach to grow by saying, peach. But you, little old you, can water that ground. You, little old you, can nourish the ground. Little old me, <laughs> little old me, I can do something about the weeds. And God makes the fruit. That's a great metaphor. If I'm using that right, similarly, I'm not sure. We'll worry about my grammar later. But when you think about the fruit of the Spirit, it's amazing the similarity. Because you cannot produce peace in your life by saying, Serenity now. <clears throat> it doesn't work. But the Bible tells you what you can do about it. When we think about those guys and whether or not they were producing or bearing the fruit of the Spirit called peace, were they bearing it? And if they weren't, why not? Why didn't they have that restful peace in any situation that the Lord expected them to have? Well, one thing we do know about them as we're uh, privy to the information is they were not at all humble. Not at that point. They're tremendous examples of human beings after the resurrection of Christ. Bigger man than me. Amazing specimen. Just a, 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 somebody I look at, the, at them and I say, wow, they get it. They're dedicating their life full time to the Lord and what he wants after the resurrection. But in that bowl, before, <laughs> they didn't know real peace. And part of that is because of number one. They were not humble before the Lord. I want you to notice how important it is and what the apostles expect of us. Did you know that Paul, did you ever notice he opens every letter wishing peace to all of us? That means, to me, it seems like this is a full-time job. This is not something that can be forgotten about, ignored, left alone. He's always saying that. He wants you and I to have peace. In fact, Peter, when he writes 2 Peter chapter 1, 
at verse 2, it says, grace and peace be multiplied. But how would we multiply? In the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So now we're starting to see there are things that we can do the same way if you wanted to produce an orange. You're not making oranges. The Lord makes the oranges. You water the ground. You're nourishing the ground. You're knocking away those weeds. And God makes the oranges. Same is true with the peace that he's leaving with us. The peace that he wants us to have, not that the world gives. So it all starts with making peace with God. Remember when the angels and the hosts of heaven, when the, the Messiah is born, they say, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. We know that the area wasn't a peaceful place. We know that humans still didn't get it. But there's something being said there that's absolutely true. You can have the peace the Lord's talking about, but he's talking about peace with God. That's where it all starts. If we would humble ourselves and say, you know, I, I, I get it. I get it. I can't make peace. Only God can do that. I'm going to do what God tells me to do, and he's going to produce peace. His word is going to produce peace. But I'm not going to wait around and do nothing, expecting him to do everything. That's disrespectful to the one who owns the orchard. He expects us to be at work in the vineyard, if you will. But he is the one that makes the fruit. I can't do it, so I'm going to humble myself and admit that. I'm going to admit that I can do nothing without Christ. Nothing. I used to be super worried. Now I'm concerned, but super worried that if I get a chance to share my faith with somebody, and if I don't have smooth words and just the right references, and if I really am not bringing my A-game, it really would break my heart. Because this person, in the rare occasion, was really seeking God, and they come across my path. Oh, 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 I want to be able to... One day I was really sad. I was burdened. Because I knew that I had a chance to share my faith with somebody, and I blew it. And I shared that sad experience with someone else. And they said, Greg, when that person shows up on Judgment Day, they're not going to be able to tell God, well, I would have obeyed the gospel if you hadn't sent Greg, your worst representative. I mean, I don't know how I didn't see that before, but when he said that, boom, peace. Suddenly, I'm not the one who causes the increase. I might be very blessed that day and be able to plant the seed. I might be very blessed that day and be able to water the seed, but God makes the increase. God makes the fruit. We water, we call the day. We're making sure we do what we're supposed to do, but God always makes it, so we have to humble ourselves. That's first. We have to make sure that we recognize that it is the Lord, as it says in Isaiah chapter 9, that he is what? The Prince of Peace. Now, I understand that to mean he's the originator. I like to think of it in terms like he invented peace. He invented you. And he invented what goes well with you, many things, and one of them is peace. He's the prince of peace. And if I don't humble myself and recognize, he's the one that produces that. But he wants me doing what I'm supposed to do so that he can do the impossible. I'm supposed to do what the word of God says to do, and he will make that fruit. It will bear in my life because of him. He's the prince of peace, not me. I am concerned if I'm going to do my job according to the Word of God. I'm concerned if I'm going to plant seeds and water them and cultivate the ground. But I'm not worried about it. Well, that would be the opposite of humble. No, no, no. I'm going to humble myself and say it must be what God does. You're familiar, I'm sure, with 1 Peter chapter 5. 
in First Peter chapter five, beginning in the middle of verse five, it tells us to clothe ourselves, right? Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that you, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all of your anxieties on Him, because He cares for you. That's a good deal. I, I, I'm not only a preacher and a Bible teacher; I'm a businessman, and I generally can see a good deal when it's right there in front. Not always. Sometimes they get by me. But that's a good deal. If I will humble myself, he will exalt me. I, I can't. I don't know when the right time is. I don't know when when is exactly the perfect timing for thus and so. But guess who does? God does. God says he will exalt me at the proper time. So I'm not going to have that anxiety. I'm going to accept it. That's one thing we have to do as workers in the vineyard, in the orchard, is recognize I can't do it, but God can. And here's the good news. Not only can he, he cares for you. He wants this for you. <laughs> There's a lot of people who have things, and they know you need them, but they don't care that you need them. They don't care, but God makes sure that you understand in that passage there, he wants you to cast all your anxieties away because he cares for you. So the first thing we have to do is recognize if we want peace, the kind of peace the Lord wants us to have, we have to humble ourselves. We have to understand how grace works, which is what's being addressed in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us how bad it was for us before we became Christians. You were dead in the, in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body, and the mind, and were by nature children of, of wrath like the rest of mankind. So see how far down we were? Then in verse 4, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him. And seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show measurable riches of what? His grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. You need God's grace. I need God's grace. The apostles communicated that we need that grace. In fact, Peter says, I want it to be multiplied to you. Grace comes in many forms as I read in the scriptures, but one of the ways it is very important to share is that sometimes you don't understand what the Bible means. And then one day you do. You read it a second time, maybe. Maybe you have a Bible study with somebody. Maybe it's read to you the seventh time or whatever. And suddenly it's clear. It's as if somebody highlighted your Bible. Suddenly you get it. I think that's only possible through God. That's grace. That's a gift that you could not, you couldn't do that without God's help. He gives grace to the humble. So we want to be humble, not the opposite of humble. Remember I said water, cultivate, and get rid of those weeds and put the nourishment in the ground? That's, this is one of the things that you can do. For God to do what you cannot do. Humble yourself. And recognize that peace comes through Jesus Christ. Not through me. Not through you. Through Christ. We find 
that out in Acts chapter 10. You find that out in Romans chapter 5. Let's go there real quick. Romans 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have, the, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Notice that it says that our peace is through our Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, later on in Ephesians 2, he says he himself is our peace. Again, that there is a fruit of the Spirit called peace. Can you make fruit? No. God makes the fruit. Peace is one of those fruits. He himself is our peace. So, if the world's offering you peace through their little formula, okay, let them have that. Go after the peace that the Lord wants you to have. And it starts with being right with God. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. If you are making peace with God, you are one with Christ. This kind of peace that Jesus is talking about is possible even for you and me. But it will not happen if you don't have humility. It will not happen if you are not in Christ. So we look there and we see on our handout, first and foremost, we have to humble ourselves. Second, we have to make sure that we recognize that peace starts with being having peace with God. What's the next thing? count our blessings. And we can't just count our blessings. We have to count our blessings on a regular <coughs> basis. Now, even the world picks up on this, guys. This is one of the things that, as I look at the Lord saying that in John 14, 27, not as the world gives, give I peace. He's trying to get us to see there's a difference. Sometimes the world steals the Lord's ideas. And bless their hearts. <laughs> They're doing the best they can. But they're not doing as good as the Lord because the Lord is the author of peace. So they might tell you this, and that's great because you need to know this. But not because they said so, because the Bible says so. We have to count our blessings. And just on a practical level, why would this produce peace? Again, you can't say peace, peace, peace to have peace. You have to do what the Bible says to do. Why would counting your blessings work? Well, it's very practical. Let's just pretend you could count your blessings all of them. Let's say it's 100,000. Do like a fun number. 100,000 things, which I bet if you really, really had to, you could find 100,000 things to be grateful for. And let's say out of 100,000, you had one less suddenly. One of those 100,000 things you no longer have so now you only have 999,999 blessings to count. What do you think? Do you feel that? I don't think you feel it. I don't think it startles you anymore. There is a practicality, a tangible, the way they should have been tangibly displaying peace in that boat when the Lord was disappointed that they didn't have any, any faith that wasn't producing peace. We can have that tangible peace that's impressive to the world, and one of the ways is to count and be thankful for our blessings. Philippians chapter 4. A good example of this. It tells us right off the bat, be anxious for nothing. And, and, and this is our this is our goal to understand. So what's anxious? What's the opposite of peace? So instead of be anxious for something, be anxious for nothing, meaning have peace about everything. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, Whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, 
whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and what? The God of peace will be with you. See how peace is laced in this passage where it tells us to have thanksgiving, and if we will, the peace of God will guard our hearts and minds. This is the right peace. This is the peace the Lord's talking about. Not as the world gives. This is the one that will guard our hearts and minds. Notice it tells us to meditate on these things. Now, to understand, but also meditate on good thoughts. Count blessings. No, you don't scream it, but tell yourself, remind yourself of the blessings in your life. Think about the good things. If you do, I'm not promising this. God promises that the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds. And you know Paul did it. He's not telling us to do something he's not willing to do. And if he did it, what's, what's this saying the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. What he's telling you, he knows what he's talking about. The God of peace will be with you. It's tangible. It's real. It's even if you're paying close attention to your life, it's measurable. But again, I want to remind you, you cannot master it in 2023 and just leave it alone. And in 2024, you'll still be cruising along in that perfect peace. No, it's got to be maintained every year. It's got to be maintained every season. It's got to be tended to the way God had Adam tending to the garden. God makes the fruit, but he has us working in the garden. One of the things we do, according to the Bible, if we want the Lord's kind of peace, it's counting our blessings. Thinking on good things. It's so easy to think on bad things. If you're trying to stay informed so that you know how to vote in this country, God bless you if you can stand it. But that's hard to watch. <laughs> the politicians behaving like politicians, that's hard to watch. And that's not what Paul's talking about. Those are not these kinds of things. They are far from just. They are far from lovely. Most of the time on the news, no matter what channel, there's no good report. So what happens? What do we do? We're trying to be responsible, trying to pay attention. There's noble things out there, and we're spending all of our time on those things and not spending time on what God wants us to do. Not spending time on telling ourselves what God told us to tell ourselves. To remind ourselves how blessed we are. To remind ourselves how good things are. Since we've been baptized into Christ, the Lord has prepared a place for us. We have a home in heaven that's eternal. And unlike the heaven on earth that Solomon saw for a very short time, the place he had prepared for us, Nothing can enter in that can defile it. Nothing can ruin the true promised land. See, there's, there's an opportunity to take in peace. That's a good thing. That's a lovely thing. So we meditate on all kinds of things like that, and that's a big one. To always remember, if this boat sinks, I have a place prepared for me where there is no sorrow. There is no death. There is no crying. Now, by reminding myself that every day, fruit. That's how God makes the fruit. See how that works. He's telling us if we will do these things, the peace of God will guard our hearts and minds. The next thing on your list, number four. This might seem odd. Learn to love the commandments of the Lord. See, we as human beings, we have a natural tendency to love the blessings. 
And you should. You should appreciate blessings. You see, there's a carrot and the stick. And the Lord is motivating us with the carrot and with the stick, right? He tells us all about heaven, but he also makes sure we're aware that there's eternal punishment. The carrot and the stick. I get it that, that we should also be mindful of the Lord's warnings while we look at the Lord's blessings. But wait a minute. There's a common denominator for those two things, the carrot and the stick. That's the law of the Lord. What does he say there? I put it in Matthew chapter 7, and verse 24. Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. See, he's saying, this is what happens when you obey my law. It's like building your house on the rock. That's why Psalm 119 and verse 165. Great peace have those who love your law. Wow. See, that's opposite of what we normally do. We love the benefit of law without loving the law, and that's a mistake. That doesn't produce peace. We recognize that the Lord's law is what? Well, according to Psalm 19, it's perfect. The law of the Lord is perfect. Don't you love that song? I love that song. I love singing that song. It tells us all about the Lord's law. That it's perfect. It's perfect restoring and converting the soul. It's, it's perfect and it is sure. It makes wise the simple. I love that. What makes wise the simple? The law of the Lord, the statutes of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord. I want to be wise. I cannot be wise without the law of the Lord. I love the law of the Lord. I love it because, Greg, can't, I don't have a chance to be a lawyer. I don't have a chance to be a doctor. I wasn't given that talent. I read a medical book. I'm falling asleep. I, don't, I can't do it. There's people who are born with the ability to read boring books, retain that information, and pass a test. That's not me. And that's okay. God made me the way he made me. But he doesn't want me to stay foolish. I can change from being foolish to wise. Isn't that exciting? I can't change, stupid. Right? I have a level of smarts, and that's what he gave me. That's who I am. But if I'm foolish, I can change that. I can be wise. What makes that possible? The law of the Lord. If that's true, and you know it is, if that's true, uh, you've got to love the law of the Lord. Oh, well, I'm glad I love it, because why? Well, like we just read, Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing causes them to stumble. Wow. If I want the peace that the Lord's talking about, I know that it's very, very important that I remind myself that the law of the Lord produces so many wonderful things. It enlightens my eyes. It is clean and endures forever. It's true and righteous altogether. You know what? It's more to be desired than gold. Yeah. Than much fine gold. Sweeter than honey. What is? The law of the Lord. Again, human beings, our natural way is to love the blessing. Love the reward. And that's okay. But you love the law first. And if you don't love the law, meditate on what it does for you. Because if you don't love the law, you're cheating yourself out of the nourishment that brings forth peace. Romans chapter 8, verse 5 and 6. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. 
Oh, that's big. Did you notice that? To be carnally minded, boom, death. But to be spiritually minded is life, but not just life. Life and peace. <laughs> life, but not just any old life. God kind of life. Spiritually minded. Life and peace. So now we are doing what? We are looking at what God has done for us. Number five, meditate on the one hope of every Christian. What is that one hope? If you have one hope, what is that one hope? Eternal life. If you're not, if you're not, if you haven't already figured that out, if you could have one hope, it should be that the Lord comes back quickly and takes you home. Because that's forever. Nobody can ruin that. Nobody can take that away from you. Nobody can steal it. Nobody can burn it down. It's the Lord's reward for you. Everything else that's in this world, you can lose. Even the good stuff. Your one hope is eternal life with the Lord. You need to be spiritually minded because if you are, that produces life and peace. We've got to convince ourselves. This is important. So again, with the maintenance of the orchard, where God makes the fruit. I love apologetics. I love evidence for the faith. And it, 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 it bothers me a little bit when I see other people that have a... Uh, don't have a desire for it. I guess I'll put it that way. That don't realize how vulnerable vulnerable they are to attack on their faith. You've been a Christian as long as you can remember. You were raised by Christians. You know you believe in Jesus. And that's all. I don't need to talk about evidence. Yes, you do. You need to be 105% convinced. In John chapter 14, before the Lord goes to the cross. He says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. See how it's linked with not letting our hearts be troubled? Believing. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am you may be also, and you know the way to where I'm going. Of course, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known the Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. The Lord is trying to get through to them and get through to us that there's a difference, a huge difference, an immeasurable difference between Jesus of Nazareth and everybody else. And the more you know that, and if you don't realize that, that's a big deal. I showed up here tonight just for that. There is no close second to Jesus of Nazareth. It's silly Forgive me if there's any atheists in the room. It's silly to think there is no God. Now, now that we agree that there is a God, of all the claims of deity, is there anybody close to this Jesus of Nazareth? In evidence, nobody. It's not even close. And he's trying to say how they need to understand that there is a difference and that they need to be convinced. And so do we. I want you to notice what happens when he rises from the dead. Remember when he rises from the dead and they're huddled in a room. Remember that? Now, do you remember? He pops in. The door's shut. He goes in there. What's his words to them? Peace be to you. That's what he says. He pops in and says, peace to you. And of course, Thomas is not there. 
So he comes back again in the room. Thomas is there. You think he's going to change the subject? No. No, that's not what he does. He says it again. John chapter 20 and verse 26. He says, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Put out your hand. Place it into my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. I want you to see how belief is strictly tied to the production of peace. He tells them peace when he walks into the room, when he is in the room suddenly. Because belief produces peace. Again, you can't make peace, but you can water the ground around that tree. You can take those weeds away. You can put that nourishment down, and then God makes that peace. Understand that you and I need to be convinced and more convinced and more convinced that Jesus is exactly who he says he is, and there is no close second. Luke puts it this way, again, with the peace to you. Notice he says, behold my hands and my feet, that it is myself. Handle me and see. He wants them to examine the evidence. But what does he say before examining it? He says, peace. So we have that clue. When we're looking at peace, how is it produced in our lives? God makes the peace, but how? what is your job? To work on your faith. Remember the boat? Remember what he says to them? They were scared. They were anxious. He says, how is it you have no faith? How is it you don't trust me? How is it you don't trust God? How is it you don't believe? close with that saying there as you know it's true Christians have peace because though we do not know what tomorrow holds we do know who holds tomorrow see you and I we have that opportunity you and I we can do what the Lord says to do Get out of his way, let him produce peace, and then ask God for opportunity to share our faith and buckle up, because he might have you go through something so that someone could examine you and see how you dealt with it. How did that not tear you apart? How did that not ruin your life? And the peace of God will guard your heart, and they'll want what you have. They'll want the peace that God produced in your life. Not only that, but what a, what a, 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 how much better would your life be if you walk around with the kind of peace the Lord wants you to have? This is the kind of thing that we want everyone to have. And I don't know all of you, and I don't know if you're in Christ. If you're not in Christ, change that tonight. I hope that you will. I hope you will obey the gospel. There's plenty of help here. You go by the scriptures and do it exactly God's way. If you do it God's way, if you humble yourself, if you do it God's way, you'll have all that he has planned for you. Sing this number that's been selected. If you're not right with God, change that tonight.